I see museums as memory palaces. Museums offer a contemplative opportunity. It's like you have a chance to reach out and touch history, touch your heritage. It's not just a place, it's an idea. To understand more about um, how America came about. The Gilcrease Museum has been described as being the most American of American museums. Many think of museums as quiet, calm, and motionless, but there is so much more that we never see. Today is moving day. When, when we lift this high enough to, for you to get your hangers off, it'll be high enough to pull the bottom out so it'll clear those brackets under there. Shoshone falls on the Snake River. Whenever Kelly and Jeff are ready. Artist Thomas Moran's last major Western landscape, an iconic, inspirational, and large masterpiece. We weighed it once. It's 744 pounds. Se yeah. 744 pounds. And priceless. Priceless? Yes. Yeah, it, uh, we can replace any one of these workers. We just can't replace the painting. <laughs> so we have one of the most impressive landscape paintings of the American West. Let's go back. Okay. We're going to slide it all the way to the end of the wall. A painting that is not just art, but history. And we find it here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Nestled next to the Arkansas River in northeastern Oklahoma, Tulsa is a thriving, friendly, and diversified city. This was once known as Indian Territory, the area where the five civilized tribes were relocated in the 1830s, including the Muscogee Creek, who were forcibly moved from Alabama and became the first residents of Tulasi, the town that preceded the city. In the early 1900s, it was the discovery of oil south of the Arkansas River that turned Tulsa into a metropolis, a booming city that was known for many years as the oil capital of the world. Those threads of Tulsa's past, its Indian history and a succession of major oil strikes, provide both a rich cultural heritage and the riches it takes to collect and preserve that heritage. Think about Oklahoma as a place where the South meets the West. The history of the West is all about encounters, about meetings. Some of those meetings are violent, some of them are filled with cooperation and understanding. Oklahoma is the perfect place to see all of those encounters of human beings over a very long period of time. Us, other museums now kind of are dying on the vine because uh, there's too much competition. Tulsa, you know, uh, very much appreciates the quality of this museum and it's kind of a win-win situation for the collection. The, the people like it, they value it. And we have one of the top two or three in the entire nation. Collections not only of Western art, Native American art, but also the treasure trove of documents that are here. It's incredible. A true copy of the original declaration. There's only one known uh, certified copy of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the original's in Washington, D.C. We've got the certified copy. It's making me have goosebumps. <laughs> Those who want to understand the American character these days are often drawn to the West, to the mythology of the frontier and Native Americans. The Gilcrease is a unique collection. It's one of the most important collections of Western American art and history in the United States. The Gilcrease Museum is not en encyclopedic by nature, but it's very focused uh, in its collecting purview and has uh, remained true to the original vision of Thomas Gilcrease in that it collects art and artifacts that help tell the story of the American experience. Thomas Gilcrease, more than anything, more than the city of Tulsa, more than the art of the Remingtons, Bierstadts, and Russells, more than the invaluable tribal artifacts, more than the work of scholars and curators, it is the vision of this man that informs the Gilcrease. Occasionally we would get up and walk around, but he'd want me to accompany him. And we reached a point that had some uh, loam in it, 
uh, out on the Gilcrease grounds. And he put his foot in the loam and left an indentation in it. And that's when he said, you see that? And I said, yes. And he said, every man leaves a track. You might as well leave a track that means something. He was telling me something profound at the time. But um, at that moment, I was just looking at this indentation in the loam. 21-year-old <laughs> young men are not very insightful. That's about as much as Thomas Gilcrease revealed to anyone about his methods, his motivation, his emotions. But he did indeed leave a track, blazing a trail into the frontier of American art and history. Thomas Gilcrease was not a writer. He did not uh, expound in depth about his collecting philosophy, about his outlook on life, and, uh, or about uh, what, why he collected what he collected. But looking at the collection itself, it's obvious that he was a man with a mission. He was focused on the uh, cultural life of America, uh, paintings, artifacts, books, rare books, uh, in a, at a time when that kind of material really wasn't uh, being pursued as much. The idea of art of America, which encompasses everything from early colonial portraits all the way through to the artist illustrators of the 20th century and beyond, is that it's really a, a mirror to our development as a culture itself. Thomas Gilcrease was born in Louisiana, the eldest of 14 children in a farming family with a Scots-Irish and French father and a mother, Elizabeth Volwell Gilcrease, who was one quarter Muscogee Creek. Her Indian blood made her eligible for property in Oklahoma's Indian country when the federal government divided tribal lands into individual plots. Thomas Gilcrease was only a year old when the family moved west, but even at that young age, his Indian heritage was to have a significant impact on his future. And Thomas Gilcrease received 160 acres uh, of land at Glenpool, about 20 miles south of Tulsa. And in 1905, oil was discovered on his land and his life was changed forever. At 15 years old, Thomas Gilcrease had a share of the largest oil discovery in North America. However, he didn't want to just collect royalties. He learned the oil business, and he was good at it. He also married young and was not so good at it. Thomas Gilcrease was married first to an Osage lady, and they, with her, they had two sons. And then later, um, a, a little bit of an, I think, acrimonious divorce. In 1913, he acquired the house uh, currently on the museum property uh, that became his residence, his uh, official residence for the rest of his life. And then he married uh, again uh, a, a younger woman and with her had a daughter and then unfortunately he divorced her as well and ended up raising the daughter um, on his own. One of the pieces that is especially important to the Gilcrease collection is the very first piece that Thomas Gilcrease purchased. And early on, this restless man with an unexpected fortune showed a surprising interest in art. It began with a simple, even sentimental painting. It's called Rural Courtship by Daniel Ridgway Knight. He had a great attention to detail and a great knowledge of anatomy and especially facial expression. So you can see in the poses, it's a very sweet painting. And Thomas, uh, had a sentimental attachment to it, and we think it probably reminded him of his own first young love. Thomas Gilcrease developed a good eye as a collector. No one really starts out as a, as a great collector. You go through periods where you collect just what appeals to you sort of on a visceral level, and then you broaden your own horizons, you learn more, and so you expand the areas that you're interested in and expand your own interest as well. And so that's what happened with him. With every acquisition, it seemed that he grew more, um, grew more knowledgeable for one thing, but also grew more to see that encompassing more of the cultural riches of America would be beneficial to him and to posterity. In a surprisingly short time, the determined oil man expanded his understanding and his range. It was no longer just art. It was archaeological finds, 
ancient artifacts of the pre-Columbian Americas. With oil still pouring out of the ground at Glenpool, Thomas Gilcrease had the financial means to do whatever he wanted to do. And what he wanted to do was build a world-class collection. Still in his 30s, his oil empire thriving, Gilcrease pursued his interest in art much the way he had his businesses, restlessly, thoroughly, unrelentingly. He traveled to Europe, he consulted with art scholars, he bartered with dealers. Yeah, Thomas Gilcrease, like most Americans at that time, looked at European art as the acme, the height of wonderful art. And so he wanted to collect that kind of material. And somebody must have whispered in his ear and said, you know, everybody's collecting that. Who's collecting the art of American Indians? Who's collecting the art of the artists of American Indians? And if someone doesn't step up to the podium and make that take that challenge on, it'll all be lost. And we are really indeed fortunate that Thomas Gilcrease, somebody whispered and he listened because frankly, without his vision, without his uh, resources, a place like this wouldn't exist, and much of the art that we see here would probably be lost to history. The Gilcrease Oil Company was headquartered for a time in San Antonio, Texas, and it was there in 1943 that Thomas Gilcrease first tried his hand at exhibiting his growing art and artifact collection. It didn't draw crowds, but his passion for collecting was undiminished. In 1947, he made perhaps the shrewdest investment in uh, American art collecting history. He per purchased the Philip uh, Gillette Coe collection, uh, a collection of 657 masterpieces by uh, the best known names in Western art, Remington, Russell, uh, Bierstadt, and others. And at that point, Thomas Gilcrease realized that he had amassed single-handedly the most important collection of Western art in existence. And like the American West itself, the things that Gilcrease was collecting were relatively new in the nation's mind, and the wealthier buyers of antiquities focused elsewhere, so it was a fairly open field. He collected in several different ways. One, by buying individual paintings from notable galleries in New York, Kennedy and Nodler in, in particular. Um, he purchased other collections, like the Cole Collection. He understood the importance of purchasing large collections by one artist. You can see a bunch of different effigy figures here. And it wasn't just art he was collecting. He was looking deeper in the American past than the recorded history that followed European occupation. He was trying to acquire as many things as he could that would tell the entire history of America. And so he acquired items from Alaska all the way down to South America. Thomas Gilcrease believed that artifacts such as these, representing 10,000 years of human occupation in North America, were truly art. These are some of the spear points that were used nine to 10,000 years ago to hunt the Ice Age, Mammoth, and Mastodon. These were literally the cutting edge of technology of the time. Okay, Robin, here's the next project we're gonna work on. Another significant purchase he made uh, in the late 1940s were uh, documents that chronicled the founding of democracy in the U United States. And there's John Hancock, president. And these were part of the Freedom Train uh, exhibition, which was uh, traveled around the United States in World War II to help sell war bonds. And they included some very important historical documents. And Thomas Gilcrease was attracted to those because they represented the, the birth certificate of the United States with uh, Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Isn't that beautiful? It's awesome. While he never explained himself, never laid out his goals in a manifesto, Gilcrease seemed to be thinking ahead of his time. He saw the history and culture and art of the American West as integral to understanding the nation as a whole, worthy of study and reflection, worthy of its own museum. 
Sometimes when we think about the West, we imagine that it is a young place. We talk about young America, about the young West. But what the Gilcrease says is that the West is a place deep in time. When you come to this place, to this museum, you are present in ancient America, a West that is rooted in a thousand years or more of human experience. Tulsa was his home, and uh, in spite of the fact that he traveled the world and had business interests outside of Oklahoma, Tulsa was always the place that he came back to. He purchased uh, the house on this property in December of 1913. At the time of the purchase, uh, Gilcrease uh, purchased 80 acres around the home and two buildings. And those original buildings, which uh, included a garage, were converted into a space for his collection. But even then, Gilcrease knew that his acquisitions were too numerous, too valuable, and too fragile to be stored in this manner. He needed a dedicated building for his collection. Because I was one of the people that decided where Gilcrease Museum was going to be. We sat out there in front in a car and uh, talked to him about putting it right there. At that time, it was just a big, flat, empty place. And uh, it wasn't so much what I liked about it, it was what he liked about it. Charles Banks Wilson was one of several artists who Gilcrease supported and even housed on the museum grounds. He made friends with uh, the living artists that he encountered in places like Taos, New Mexico, and bought directly from them or bought their works in galleries that uh, benefited them. He also, though, worked with a lot of young artists, particularly Indian artists that were just getting started, uh, buying their works, help, helping them to survive as they established their careers. And in fact, he even um, established, in a couple of cases, uh, residency programs. Uh, Willard Stone is probably the best known. He had Dad work for him at a salary for three years. Each year, he paid him a salary, and he was sort of an artist in residence. Dad would go over and stay a week there and come in on weekends. Mr. Gilcrease was trying to help Willard Stone and he had bought a lot of his work and then we sold a few of his smaller pieces in the, what amounted to a little gift shop. But Willard Stone would come in periodically, just kind of unannounced, bringing in some of his wood carvings and he would have them just wrapped up in newspaper in a brown paper grocery sack. We'd look at it and he said, well, do you think I can get $75 for this? <laughs> and we frequently we'd say, oh, you ought to last at least 100 <laughs> Thomas gave him a piece of ebony that was from Africa. The trouble was, from side to side, it was shaped like a wedge. And asked him to carve a buffalo. The only way he could get a buffalo and use that whole block of wood was to have a dying buffalo. Who was dying because he was shot with an arrow. At one time there was an arrow. Which got stolen several times from the collector. <laughs> People wanting souvenir. Thomas Gilcrease told him, said he really liked that and uh, if he, since he did that uh, out of that piece of ebony, he ought to be able to carve anything. He wanted me to paint the sign uh, of Gilcrease Museum. They put me on a, on a board across the front of the, front of the building and I was up there painting the sign at Gilcrease. And these people were walking through and they said, look, they've even got a stuffed Indian up on the front of the building. And it was just me painting a sign, Thomas Gilcrease. The quiet collector Thomas Gilcrease moved on a lot of fronts. He commissioned art by contemporary Indian artists collected ancient artifacts from South America, Benjamin Franklin here, preserved handwritten notes from America's founding fathers, acquired masterworks that told the stories of the American West. Despite his world travels and wide interests, he always returned to Tulsa. He's even buried on the museum grounds. But a museum is not a mausoleum. The idea behind this exhibit is to go from the point when the Europeans got off of the boats, what did they see, what was there, and then how did things change and what happened. 
One of the things that drives me crazy in the museum world is museums never change. Well, I'll tell you, I've worked in museums a long time. Museums change daily. There's a lot of activity behind the scenes. Uh, we are always looking to do more research, create different exhibits, do new and different interpretations. And to do that, much must happen behind closed doors. Carpentry and wiring, packing and unpacking. These are Indians painting their own, you know, events in their... Research and archiving. Do not have need those uh, before... The High level the debate about archives. exhibits. Quite a few things that insects like to eat and porcupine quills is one of them. Preservation of art and artifacts. And at the most basic level, keeping things clean and secure. People ask us about, well, you know, how much of your material uh, do you have on display? Don't you really have all of the best pieces in the basement so nobody could see them? Now, if we wanted to, we could put everything on display, uh, if we had the room, uh, and, and keep it up all the time. But I will tell you, if that happens, works on paper, pastels, watercolors fade, documents fade, textiles will deteriorate on the rack. Um, you'll lose those objects. So we really sort of serve two masters here in the museum world. We serve the public because that's where our support comes from, but we're also stewards of the objects. And we try to make sure that we uh, maintain the best preservation environments for these objects through time. The Gilcrease Museum's collection contains over 350,000 items. There are 12,000 works of fine art, 526, 1790. Right. There are more than 100,000 rare books and documents. This is the beaver effigy pipe. There are 250,000 historic artifacts. You can literally go into that collection and find anything you want when you're wanting to reference, if you're wanting to facilitate a researcher, if uh, you're wanting to put on an exhibit. We can literally go into this collection and find just about anything we need. This pipe is 2,000 years old. There are real river pearls for the eyes and real beaver teeth for the teeth. Whoever carved this was a master carver. This is probably one of the finest, if not the finest, Hopewell pipes in existence. It's, it's extremely rare. You see a lot of raven pipes. You see a lot of bird, bird pipes, frog pipes, not beaver pipes. Also, just the sheer artistry of the carving. It's perfect. One of the great things about Thomas Gilcrease was that he collected, he would acquire entire collections. When Thomas Gilcrease took up archaeology, in addition to collecting art, storage was simply a shelf in the basement. Now the museum's huge collection is bursting at the seams, and it isn't just a matter of shelf space. There. That's a big one. That's big. Archaeology is about solving the mysteries left by the past. We're looking at these West Mexican figures that were interred with human remains about 2,000 years ago. And we're trying to authenticate them and separate out the forgeries from the real figures. One of the ways that we know this is an authentic piece is we have found insect puparia, such as the one that we're looking at on the screen right now, that tell us that they were present in the tomb uh, this is really something that the forgers have not been able to replicate at this point. So it's, it's the best way for us to know that this is an authentic figure. And while Eric and Cheryl work downstairs, museum curators and academics are thinking about how they'll exhibit these items. Then we're not endangering this particular headdress. This one looks like it, it has it's, a little age yeah. on it and a little bit wear and tear. Yeah. When you look, for example, at, at, um, at artifacts, at let's say stone tools that are thousands of years old or hundreds of years old, you can use those stone tools to tell a story about function. Here's how people use these tools to do certain things. You can tell a cultural story. Um, you can talk about how that society was organized, where it lived, uh, what it did, who it interacted with. Um, you, can, you can tell a, a story just about the materials from which the objects were made. You can tell a technology story. So there are lots of stories to tell. 
Thomas Gilcrease collected not only things that were very old, representing cultures in North America, but he also collected from the historical period. You'll recognize some of the pottery from the American Southwest. He also collected clothing and other, other everyday items. These are some great examples of uh, beadwork uh, from different tribes across the Great Plains. Um, and each of these tells a story. Uh, each style, each color combination, each design uh, is, is definitive of a, particular, of a particular tribe. So how does an ancient artifact find its way from underground storage to a display case? Uh, we have bi-monthly meetings where the staff gets together to talk about the exhibition schedule, to talk about new uh, exhibit ideas, and to vet those and bring those forward, and it generally takes uh, three to, to five years to fully uh, develop an exhibit uh, from the idea stage to uh, opening. I will say that developing exhibits is one of the most interesting and rewarding things I've ever done. It is also one of the most contentious and frustrating things I've ever done because you have lots of people involved in the process, each with strong opinions, uh, everyone with, with sort of a, a passion for the subject. Um, that's the fun part of my job. Um, there, I would say it, it, from the concept stage, um, there are many of us that work on that, um, sort of brainstorming. And then here's the, the saddle blanket. Oh, that's the saddle blanket. You will often have a curator, an educator, and a designer uh, serving as a core team. Uh, the role of the curator, obviously, is to know the objects and, and what they represent. The role of the educator in this process is to be the advocate for the public. You know, what, what is it about this topic that's going to be interesting? What is it that we think people know about this topic? Or what do we think they want to know? The role of the designer is, show me what this looks like in three dimensions. Well, I would say you haven't a clue how hard it is. There are, first, you need the good idea. And everyone thinks they have a good idea, but quite often it isn't a good idea. So you get the good idea, then you have to also have the venue for it. So where is the space going to be? Is it going to be here or there? And then the reality is you have to fund it. But first, back to the catacombs. A floor below the archaeological rarities is stored another vault of treasures, the material Gilcrease is most famous for, the artwork. And there's so much to choose from. Here in storage, where the depth of the Gilcrease art collection is staggering. I can keep going, but we're gonna be here all day. The collection is not, not simply an art collection. He began to collect paintings that uh, told the story of the history of the Americas, both Americas. The breadth and depth of the collection is of extreme importance. There was a special relationship between Thomas Gilcrease and Woody Crumbo. Um, Crumbo was a Potawatomi uh, Indian artist and uh, Gilcrease met him around 1945 uh, and bought about 27 pieces from him directly from the artist. Um, eventually, he hired Crumbo uh, both to create works for the collection, but also to help him build the entire collection of Gilcrease Museum. As you can see, uh, Crumbo's work by nature was documentary, so he is preserving Native American traditions in his work. And dance was especially important to him because he was also a dancer himself. You can see in animal dance, he's within the traditional style of Native American art, but he also used transparent watercolor, which you can see the contrast with these vague, wet into wet, um, sort of dissolving colors in the background, and then the very opaque um, shapes that are done in tempera, so it, it makes a nice contrast and gives a sort of an atmosphere to the painting itself. 51 3 8s. To exhibit work like Crumbo's, another group of skilled workers steps in. 72 7 8s. The artisans who frame, light, and hang the artwork. An exacting process in many, many ways. There's always a challenge. There's always a new problem. And, you know, every painting's a different width and height. So uh, we go through a math 
process of laying that out and to give it an equal space. And in this case, it's uh, 12 and 5 eighths uh, inch difference dimension between each. So it's, a, it's quite the process to figure out where the clips on the back of the paintings end up through that process. And uh, after we get these all up and labeled, uh, then we'll start the lighting process. Uh, each fixture has its own dimmer. Uh, they each have a fuse, so that if one has a problem, the fuse will pop here and not knock everything out down the road. Uh, everything from UV filters uh, to spread lenses, you can change the shape uh, of a beam of light. Um, dimming screens, louvers. See what that does with the stubby for the middle one? If you have an oil painting uh, which can uh, accept up to like 25 to 35 foot candles and right next to it might be a, um, a work on paper, uh, charcoal, pen and ink, that sort of thing. Typically you wouldn't want to go any higher than 10 foot candles and then you may have a rare art, uh, document from our archive which uh, probably doesn't need any light at all. Uh, but each fixture is dimmable, so you can display those side by side. Gilcrease has one of the most fabulous sculpture collections in this part of the country. You want to be able to see the nuances that the sculptor put into it, like you know the eyes and like some of the undersides, because you've got to realize the sculptor spent just as much time on the back as he did on the front. And if you overlight this, you won't get all this wonderful texture and stuff in here. It'll just be a glare. And so it's, it's just actually a little bit more challenging, which makes it a little bit more fun. We cut our uh, dado this. here and then lap that dado there. As far as new materials coming out, um, that changes our world quite a bit. And, uh, we, uh, we used to do things different in the 80s. And, you know, well, I used to throw art in a box with hay. That's, that, was, that was a good wrap. Well, they don't do that anymore. And there's uh, different products that are um, being made all the time for archival reasons. And, um, you know, just help keeping the art safe is, is challenge. This wood right here, it's called MDF, and it's basically pressed sawdust that's formed under heat and they use formaldehydes and glues which as that cures it off gases and you could okay it probably has a sulfide in it and that's going to tarnish any kind of metal and it continually off gases working with Victoria that's a lot of fun too because she will send us lists of new materials that are approved and materials that we used to use that aren't approved and it gets challenging to present some of this artwork with our old training and her new input on acceptable materials. The arm edges, the armhole edges. Which brings us to another layer of the museum behind the scenes. Conservator Victoria Book Lupia is rarely seen in the Gilcrease galleries, but she's hard at work. My main job is to um, preserve art and artifacts for as long as possible so they can be enjoyed and appreciated by as many people as possible. Um, a large part of that role is preservation, so preventing deterioration. The other part is restoration um, or aesthetic conservation so that it can still be appreciated. You're not noticing the years of damage that go by, you're really noticing the, the beauty of the object. I don't think that people really recognize the amount of time and effort it takes to get museum objects ready for exhibition. In a perfect world, um, if we were doing a show of, of a couple of hundred objects in conservation, we would like to have that list two years in advance. Um, and that doesn't usually happen, but uh, because the first thing that we would do with that group of objects would be to about two inches do what we call a condition survey, right. which is to go through and look at each object individually and determine whether or not it's, it's even possible to exhibit it. 
that I'm constantly fighting time, basically, and the natural deterioration. And uh, of course, some aging is acceptable, but of course, we don't want anything to deteriorate to the point where you can't appreciate it. I am trying to gently brush on a little bit underneath these loose quills and lay them down and hold them in place so that once the acetone uh, evaporates, the um, adhesive will pull the quill down. I, I feel like it took a while to get to this point, so I'm very, I'm very happy that I get to work with objects. Um, and I try to be very careful with them. Um, as Victoria said, it's a little bit, it's a little bit difficult to, um, to be so close to things that will be uh, around for so, so long. Because you are given the opportunity, but also um, the duty of preserving these things. Um, so it's, just, it's it can be it can be kind of scary at times. And there is one bead still there. With a staff mostly of volunteers and interns, the Gilcrease Conservator has her plastic gloved hands full. And then they got fuller. For the 500th anniversary of Amerigo Vespucci's death, the Italian explorer who mapped and gave his name to America, an Italian museum wanted an exhibit about frontier America. They came to Tulsa. There wasn't much time. Historian Herman Viola was recruited to curate the exhibit. This is just fabulous. I've, it's been a month since I've been here, and you have really done a miracle. We've been really busy here. I had uh, two other conservators helping me, and uh, we've worked on almost 150 objects. I think wow. we're at 46 paintings. I've done two major exhibits, and both took over four years. Uh, then you have the flip side of the story, where you have kind of the deadline for the opening, and you find out that it all should have been done yesterday, <laughs> and instead we're going to do it tomorrow. And the, the stress here has been pretty severe. We only had, I think, five months, maybe even less than that, to identify exactly which objects were going, prepare them all for exhibit, uh, for travel, prepare their travel mounts, uh, organize everything, permits, documentation, you need all sorts of things just to go through customs. We're not going to be able to send this one to Italy because it has genuine eagle feathers on it. Isn't that a shame? Well, it's a shame, but you know, we have to work with, with not only state and federal laws, but international laws that govern the use of uh, endangered species and, and parts of endangered species, and eagle feathers are part of that. Now, the good news is, uh, through a, a museum colleague in Brussels, Belgium, we're going to be able to borrow a feathered headdress uh, that, was, that was made before 1930. It's in Brussels, and so that can be shipped from there to Italy. We can use it in the show in the same way that we would use this one. It's such an opportunity for Gilcrease to show our collections and to tell a story that is relevant to us. And we take that seriously. It's not just about, you know, showing art. It's about the story that it tells um, and making sure that it's, it's maybe not the story that people expect to hear, uh, particularly European audiences. Sometimes they have a different idea of, of what the West is. And, and so it's our role um, to, to let the items speak for themselves, but to also offer a narrative that puts them into context approximately 17 inches. This piece is going um, on loan to Italy uh, soon, and when that happens, it will be going with several other um, beaded leather items, clothing and things. So we want to make sure that, that when these objects are coming in, that they can tell the difference between this vest and other vests that may be going. But a written condition report is not enough to document these priceless items. Yeah, it's pretty uniform light. A visual record must be created as well. Sometimes it can take one hour to photograph one object. And when you, you have 250 objects going to Italy, you, you can and start to see the time involved in um, putting something together. Because as, as you know, once, once you um, look at your raw footage, uh, your work is just beginning in some ways. <laughs>
There are many obstacles to overcome with such an ambitious project, the least of which is language. Hello. Hello. Uh, Katerina Chiarelli, please. Hello. Hi, Katerina. How are you? Fine, Katerina. How are you doing? We've been having these conference calls with Italy, and the, the amusing thing about it all is that uh, I can't speak Italian. My parents came from Italy, but they didn't want me to have an accent, so they wouldn't teach me Italian. And the uh, folks here in Gilcrease don't speak Italian. Those Italians over there we're working with have very limited English. So try to put a program together where you don't have much really good communication. Uh, she would like to know if we have questions for her. Uh, yes, uh, we do. And then, uh, miracle of miracles, the, in Tulsa here you have, uh, I think his name is Marcelino Angelini, the director of the Tulsa Ballet who is a legitimate Italian, who can speak Italian, and so they brought him in to be the interpreter. There might, there might be a little problem with the cases, just like we were discussing, discussing here, to get in and out of the museum. Um, if they're too big, they need to be open in the Boboli Gardens behind the Palazzo Pitti, and then they need to take everything in by, by hand. There's one large uh, case that I'm aware of. Do you there are numerous uh, crates that are oversized. I don't have the exact dimensions, uh, but I can provide those. And they're already built? They're already built. Uh, and packed. See, and packed? And packed. Uh, and see, packed. So no, no, no solo Which brings up an interesting point. How do you prepare hundreds of fragile artifacts to be shipped overseas? It puts pressure down on the dress to hold it in place so that it doesn't shift. I'm trying to figure out the best way is to trap it effectively without compromising any of these delicate areas, giving it adequate support. And then what we'll do is use, this, use a guillotine, so to speak. It'll actually hold that down. This, it'll be reshaped to fit this one. And then another one will come down here and hold that in place. Then when the box is closed, pressure will activate there. It's just enough to uh, keep it in stable position without putting excess pressure on it. We have packing and, and unpacking. We try to limit who does that uh, to our own staff or at least very qualified staff at another institution. So you don't have just anybody touching objects. And then we have uh, air flights, we have trucks and, and uh, road rash that comes along with that. So we take good care of it to pack it up very carefully, very specifically for each object so that it's supported during transportation. This is an unusual exhibit. Um, typically when we do international loans, we're loaning one to two paintings. This is very different in the amount of material that we're sending and also what we're sending. It's rare that we send anthropological items across the seas. 11, I count 12. Right now we're just making sure that our lists, our inventories of what's going on this truck are correct and um, the guys have what we say they have. My day is hectic. Um, we're loading the truck now and then I'm jumping on a plane this afternoon and uh, we'll fly to Atlanta and tomorrow morning I'm meeting with Fish and Wildlife and Customs to make sure that everything in the crate is what we say it is. And she will watch them uh, palletize all of this, get it ready for a commercial airliner that will take us to Italy tomorrow afternoon. And then it lands in Italy, we get it off the plane, we get it onto two trucks, and we drive it from Rome to Florence. And then we unload the crates at the museum, and they're allowed 24 hours to acclimatize. And uh, then we start our work of unloading the crates the next day. We have a very limited time span to unpack all of this, check it all, make sure it survived the trip fine, and watch them get it up on the wall and uh, get a show open. So it's a lot of work. It's a journey of thousands of miles for these priceless objects. From Gilcrease in the America named after Amerigo Vespucci to Florence, his birthplace, where museums began 600 years ago. For Thomas Gilcrease, the man who originally wanted to collect the art of Europe, it is a moment of validation. The exhibit, uh, New Frontiers, uh, will reach a, a European and worldwide audience. 
and will probably be seen by over a million people uh, during the six month period it will be there. There aren't many museums that would do this sort of thing, but I do think what you're going to see here is the uh, model for other museums in the United States to say, boy, that worked beautifully, why don't we do this? And I would say the Gilcrease is on the cutting edge of that kind of opportunity. For the Gilcrease Museum, taking risks is nothing new. Thomas Gilcrease often took risks in order to grow his collection. In the 1950s, his passion for collecting outran his business revenues. His debt was so great, it looked like he might have to give it all up. He was uh, asked by a wealthy collector in Texas if he would consider selling part of it or anything. And the collector told him that he would buy whatever Gilcrease wanted to sell. And Gilcrease's response was, how could I sell one of my children? That led to an unusual deal. He offered it uh, to the city of Tulsa. And the city of Tulsa and the residents of the city of Tulsa in a public referendum in 1954, voted by a three to one majority to use public funds to pay off the debts of a private individual. And I know of no other case in history where this has happened. As Thomas Gilcrease's oil business revived, he dedicated that income to paying off the Tulsa bond issue that saved his collection. The Gilcrease Museum now belonged to the city. When the debt was paid, the museum had become essentially a gift. The tie to Tulsa was indissoluble. Thomas Gilcrease would live out his life in his house on the museum grounds, and even though he did not own the museum, he was still Mr. Gilcrease. He would say, come sit with me. And that was essentially a request to go out in front of the museum and sit on a bench with him, and he would chat with us. He was a he was a very quiet, very uh, uh, gentle individual. It was obvious to me that he was very lonely. He had nobody to share anything with. Mr. Gilcrease had a place up in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and we just hit it off and we talked about trout fishing. He'd ask me what kind of trout I caught in southern Colorado and what kind of bait I used and that I prefer stream fishing over fishing in the lakes, and we just had a great conversation. Charlie and I were just young college students then. Uh, we didn't realize at the time uh, the significance of what was going on in front of us. But some of the stories he told us were just uh, incredible when you, uh, when you think about the fact that none of those things ever show up in history books. He went down to, to put some money in a bank and the way they treated him, he decided he'd just buy the damn bank. And, and uh, that was kind of where uh, that came about. They, they belittled him, and he wouldn't stand for that. And uh, that's the reason that he bought that bank. He did, he did have a sense of humor. I can remember one story um, where a, a patent attorney was at the museum, and he asked him, if he could secure a patent for him on an old Indian relic. And the man asked, perhaps, what is it? And Mr. Gilcrease smiled and said, me. Okay. Okay. Okay, and you can just kind of let her slide if you want, to some degree. As unique as Gilcrease is for its location, its founder, its ownership, its mother load of Western art and artifacts, there can be no standing still. Go to the second door. When we move a painting, like for instance, Shoshone Falls, which is one of the largest, or if not the largest painting that we have in the collection, um, there is a certain amount of uh, nervousness about it and you know, anxiety. Um, we have uh, a very dedicated staff that have the knowledge uh, of exactly how to do that and to do it safely. Okay. The world is changing, technology is changing the world, and the world of museums must keep moving okay. too. Will it make it under there? Literally and figuratively. Take it on then. Better than leaning. We've been confronted with a series of technological advances. 
that are digital in nature that set up a set of screens between us and the exterior world. A set of screens that separate us from other people and from nature and from the past. Looking pretty good. All right, and away we go. Of course, you know, we can have one of the greatest collections, but if few people know about it, um, what is what is its use? It's not being utilized to the best of its ability. Stop. Our competitors are the shopping malls, the ballparks, any place that you would spend a leisure dollar. And that's what a museum visit is for most people. <laughs> All right, tip it up if you want to. Much bigger moves lie ahead. An alliance with the University of Tulsa has led to a degree program in museum science and management and plans for construction of a new research center to house the Gilcrease Archives collection. Over 100,000 books and documents and manuscripts that represent a great archive of American history. So those now can be researched and mined and understood better and, and it's going to just be a, a, a terrific way to complete the story that Tom Gilcrease wanted to tell. Hey ladies, how's it going? It's going pretty We're good. Doing okay. The archival collections at Gilcrease, I think, are one of the collections that most people don't know about. They are just as extensive as the art collection and the anthropology collection. We have items from colonial Mexico. We have items from colonial America, such as George Washington's gardening book, a letter written by Thomas Jefferson um, two days before the Declaration was signed. Um, we also have documents relating to Native American history, the John Ross papers, the Peter Pitchland papers. What document is this, Renee? This is the Diego Columbus letter from 1512. This is one of the earliest letters sent from what you would call the New World or the Americas. There's nothing like actually seeing the real document or seeing that real book. Um, there's some kind of, I don't know, and this is from a book lover, there's an attachment and a love that forms when you're looking at it and there's that aha moment and that gasp of, oh my gosh, that's the real thing. That's awesome. It's not on a screen. It's right there in front of them. Come along, mini masters. Like many museums, like all museums, the Gilcrease must answer the question, what is the role of this institution in the modern changing world? All right, come on this way. It's very important to get the children involved at an early age. If you don't teach it now, they'll never grow to have a love for it. Uh, if you want institutions and museums to survive, your children are your answer. When I was a kid, I grew up in suburban Chicago in the 1950s. It was, I guess, the crabgrass frontier. It was the world of Ozzie and Harriet and Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best. We broke out of that, I guess, when as sixth graders, our school system would load us into the yellow buses and take us on what I guess we called the Great Chicago Museum Tour. We went to the Art Institute, to the Field Museum, to the Museum of Science and Industry. And in a sense, that visual story brought me into a world that was larger and richer and deeper than I had ever imagined. And I think that sixth grade experience on the yellow school buses has molded me and shaped me in sometimes mysterious ways so that museums have always been part of my life. You don't necessarily need to go to a museum to see what painting looks like, but it is an entirely different experience when you're standing in front of it yourself and it's just a few feet away. It's the light is different, the paint looks different, it glows in a different way. And that's something that can only be experienced in a museum. What this painting is, it's called Dividing of the Offering, and it's by an artist named Charles Banks Wilson. And what's happening is all of these people have come together. Watching children in museums is probably the best part of any curator's job, is you have the opportunity to see somebody experience something for the first time, or returning with their families to show them something that they saw and loved. 
And then the people who in their 40s say, I started coming here when I was in the fifth grade and I make sure I'm bringing my children out here. Where we were is not where we're going. Uh, even if we don't change, our audiences change. Okay, let's take off our backpacks, open them up. The expectations of the audience changes and we have to, we have to be part of that. We have to keep up with those. Is this smooth? Okay. One more push, and I think I'm on. Okay. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Thomas Gilcrease, a man who understood that objects had stories to tell. He gave them their voice to tell America's story. He gave us Gilcrease Museum.